Um, Anne, maybe you want to kick off and have the panelists introduce themselves. Yeah, so thank you for the intro, Jamie. And thank you again to all of our panelists for being with us here tonight, we know you're taking a lot of time out of your day, so we really appreciate you being here. So to start us off, uh, I would like to ask all the panelists if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, your role, your career, uh, the company you work with, and we can go in any particular order so any panelists can feel free to start us off. All right, you know what guys, I'll jump in um, to start. Uh, can you guys all hear me? Yep, we can hear you. So um, my name is Anna Wen. I am currently working for Barclays Capital Markets on the equity derivative side. Um, I graduated from Macaulay Honors College in 2005. So I was the first year alum uh, of the program. And um, currently I am running the, uh, I'm the US head of the equity derivative lifecycle management team. Um, I've been with Barclays for three years now. Um, in the past, I've dabbled on every sectors, every area that you can think of. I've had a startup myself in blockchain. Um, I worked at other parts of the capital markets as well. I've worked at fixing, come on the trading floor in um, Morgan Stanley. Um, on the private equity side, I've worked in the APEC region doing cross-border transactions for um, uh, my coverage was in biopharmaceutical uh, area. So um, transitioning back into co capital markets um, for the U.S. regions. And recently for the past two months, I've taken over the EMEA side as well, which is the uh, the, the U.K., European, um, uh, greater M Middle Eastern uh, region as well. Um, so that's my background. Thank you so much for starting us off, Anna. And uh, any panelists who would like to go next, please just feel free. Um, yeah, I guess I could go next. Hi, everyone. My name is Donald. Um, I graduated in 2017 from Baruch College Macaulay Honors, and I majored in finance there. Um, I'm currently working at a startup called Basecap Analytics. Um, we've been around for around like seven years or so, um, six to seven years. So um, basically, I started off there as more of like a financial analyst role and then kind of transitioned to becoming a product manager. So right now, um, I'm kind of like the person that goes in between like the business side, which deals with mostly like finance or mortgage related clients and the technology side, which is like developers, you know, DevOps and IT. Um, so, yeah, really, really enjoy the, the role right now. And um, if anyone, you know, if anyone has questions about either finance or tech, Happy to answer. Uh, so Donald actually brought up a good segue for me to just add in here that we will have breakout rooms um, starting at around seven. And so by then everybody will have time to be able to ask our panelists one-on-one uh, -on -one or in smaller groups, any questions you may have specifically about their uh, individual roles and experiences. And with that said, uh, I'll pass it on to the next panelist. I can jump in. Oh, sorry. You can go yeah, ahead. Please. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Gabrielle. Uh, I graduated in 2019 from Hunter College in Macaulay. Um, I majored in economics and I have been at Goldman Sachs since I graduated. So I interned there in 2018 and have been full time since May 2019, almost two and a half years. Um, I started off in operations, supporting sales and trading, global market securities, whatever you want to call it, it depends on um, where you're at, and was really close to our multi-asset platform sales um, desk. And then I actually moved over to HCM or HR um, a little over a year ago to focus on compensation strategy for the firm. So that's been really exciting, a lot of more project heavy work. Um, and we cover basically all, all of the 40,000 plus employees at the firm. So that's been really interesting. And um, I heard that there are some questions about transitioning into the workforce. Definitely happy to um, try and provide any insight on that as well. So nice to meet all of you. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael. Macaulay. I initially came in as an accounting major, but in junior year, I switched over to finance. Um, and while I was in college, I learned of this industry 
on helping stress and distressed companies. Uh, so I pursued an internship in the bankruptcy and restructuring space. Um, I joined a small group uh, within a bigger accounting company, a national accounting firm, and it's going to be close to two years now, but uh, about two years ago, I transitioned to FTI, which is one of the, uh, the largest players in the bankruptcy restructuring space. And um, I'm in their corporate finance and restructuring practice, specifically in the TMT vertical. Thank you, Michael. And do we have, I think, John and Stephanie? Sure, I'll go next. Um, hi, everyone. My name is John. I graduated from Macaulay and Berg in 2019. I majored in operations management, and currently I work at MUFG as a credit analyst uh, covering tech, media, and telecom. But previously, for about a year and a half, I covered healthcare. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Stephanie. I attended Queens College. I graduated in 2019 um, and I studied international business and econ. Um, I'm currently at BlackRock uh, working under um, the Aladdin Client Services team, which is our technology arm um, in supporting our um, investment, our investment platform. I'm really excited to be here and chat with you guys today. Thank you for joining us today, and, Stephanie. And, and, and I think we have Max. Could, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to round it out. Hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you all. Uh, I, I graduated from the Queens chapter of Macaulay in 2018. Uh, I currently work at Barclays uh, in their capital markets division, specifically focused on, on debt private placements, which I'm happy to speak about more uh, later in the, in the panel. Um, majored in, in finance and econ, and I'm um, just happy to be here. So I uh, look forward to meeting everyone. Okay, great. So that covers the basic intros for all of our panelists and kind of delving into a bit more of uh, what each of you do on a day to day basis. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about, you know, what a typical day looks like for you and feel free to add in, you know, if this pandemic has kind of changed the way that your day to day work looks like. Uh, I'm happy to start this off. Um, one of the reasons why I actually chose consulting is because from the people that I've spoken to who are in the industry, um, they basically said that the day-to-day -day can vary drastically. Um, and I would say that no two days are really the same. And it really depends on the people I'm working with and the projects I'm on. Um, so more recently, I've been working on more short-term transaction-based pro uh, projects where we're doing uh, diligence for either the buyer or the seller of a company. Um, and in those, I get a sense of what that three to four week sprint looks like. But being in consulting, um, you, get, you get exposed to a whole different, a whole variety of projects. And each project has its own intricacies from each project, um, you might be working with different people. So it depends on the people you're working with, the project you're on. Um, and yeah, there's a, a whole lot of variety. And the variety makes it a great place to start for me because um, you're learning about how to interact with different types of people and um, solving different kinds of problems. Okay, uh, Max, did you want to go next to tell us about your day-to-day? -day? Sure. I, I have to echo um, what was just said. I um, No two days are the same. My role is very transaction oriented. So at any given point, you're working on, on deals for companies that have hired us to, to help them, you know, in my role, at least uh, raise capital in the form of, of privately placed debt. Uh, it's super interesting. It's very tied to the markets. So, you know, some of you guys who are, I guess, are, are majoring in economics or finance may follow the Fed activity. Um, you know, different macroeconomic uh, updates and things like that. So my job is very tied to what's going on in the markets, which is super interesting. It keeps the job interesting. Uh, I also uh, don't specialize in any specific vertical. So a lot of my uh, particular role is, is focused around getting up to speed and, and things from you know, aviation to consumer to healthcare to power. And I guess it's something interesting for people on, on the, on the uh, panel to think through is, you know, do you find more interest in something very, very niche and specific in particular, or are you somebody who likes to know a little bit about many different things? That's something that I think the internship helped me, uh, you know, with, and, and something I appreciate in my job is exposure to many different things, but I guess it's something for people on this uh, panel to think through too. 
Great. Thank you for your insight, Max. Uh, Donald, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so kind of like echoing what McCall and Max said, like, yeah, my my job is pretty similar in that, like, you know, er, like day to day is pretty different. Um, from a product management standpoint, like it really depends on the project that you're dealing with and what, what the client's needs are. Um, so, you know, like we have a lot of um, features that, you know, I have to help like prioritize and um, a lot of clients to, you know, communicate with. So I don't, I, like, I wouldn't say there's ever really a, a day-to-day and that, that's what makes it very interesting. Like, um, I think the variety is great, especially as in the beginning um, when you start off your field and you're not too sure, like, what exactly you love to do. I think being able to see the variety is is definitely a very big plus um, in trying to understand, like, you know, what, what you like personally. Um, so, you know, that definitely helped me because um, even initially when I started a startup, I was in more of a fin- finance related role, um, but I got to touch like other parts of the company um, because we, we only had like 10 people. So I was like helping out with marketing and helping out with like tech and everything. And eventually I kind of like found a niche that, that you know, I enjoyed and kind of, you know, stuck to it. So. Yeah, I would definitely recommend like starting off in a, you know, more diverse role and then later on, like trying to, you know, hone in, hone in on, on, on one thing you like. And I think, um, I think Anne also asked about like how the pandemic affected things. Um, for me personally, like my job before involved like some sort of traveling occasionally. Um, so the pandemic definitely like, you know, put that all to a halt. Um, however, um, you know, we kind of adopted more of a, you know, remote culture. So people um, like clients and, and people in the company, everyone's just always, um, you know, doing like Zoom calls and Teams calls and everything. And, you know, it, it, work, it works out pretty well. I, I think, um, you know, a lot of companies were able to adapt. And now we're kind of trying to, you know, um, find like a hybrid ground between remote and, and you know, always being in person. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point that we're all adapting to this Zoom world just like we are right now. And uh, following up with that, Anna, would you like to go next? Oh, Anna, I believe you're still on mute. Yes, hi, sure. Uh, I believe I'm in a very different role because I've been out of the, you know, I'm no longer fresh out of college. So I'm at a very different uh, career path right now. So because I have, um, uh, 12 people that are reporting um, to me right now um, across MIA and US. Um, and, you know, I don't necessarily do uh, the date, but I did remember when I was um, first out of college as analyst. I, at that time, I was a junior trader and more different. And obviously, Wall Street at that time. Um, are under different regulatory requirements are, are also run very differently. Um, nowadays, uh, my typical day from um, 7 a.m. to about 1 p.m. U.S. time, I'll be in meetings back to back, and then I'll have like, you know, quick lunch. And then from 2 p.m. to 4 or 5 p.m. are mostly people management. So um, escalations from both regions, um, you know, any conflicts between employees and then performance management, that's what I do. And then towards the end of the day, I start catching up on emails and, you know, pretty, pretty much finish up some of the, um, you know, the, the catching up with salespeople and our structuring team to, to manage if there are any new um, product that's coming up on the pipeline or any new um, clients requirements. And then usually what we do is um, over... 70% of our trades are, are coming in from the APAC region, actually. So um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, like Barclays is actually number one in the world for uh, issuing stru- we, we A lot of our pipelines are funneled through our APAC regions. So, um, uh, you know, I'll go home around like 4 a.m. starting. You know, that's when we are getting execution order from Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Singapore. So sometimes I would even lock in around like 4. Uh, so it's pretty much like a 24-hour shift of work. Um, and, and, you know, we kind of like manage to, to do with that. Uh, yeah, so that's my typical day. Your typical day sounds like it's definitely very busy <laughs> and uh, full, but that's Wonderful that you're, you know, you take part in so much of helping the way that Barclays runs. And moving on, uh, John, would you like to tell us about what your typical day looks like? 
Sure. Um, so I'll start with credit analysts do is that we write credit reports that include business and financial analysis. And we ultimately establish a credit rating. And that kind of determines how comfortable we are lending to the companies we're using. Um, and it kind of goes through two different avenues is that we could either have an annual review from a regulatory perspective, we have to review all of our names at least once in our portfolio on a yearly basis. And then we also have live deals where the kind of day-to-day -day could shift. Um, usually there's about a, a week to two week turnaround time. If we have a facility that's gonna be run like a revolving credit facility or a term loan that we have to do all these operations to make sure it gets done. Um, it was a lot busier during the pandemic, especially towards the beginning. I was covering healthcare at the beginning. So there was a lot of uncertainty especially if you look at medical device manufacturers, uh, REITs, which if you're not familiar with REITs on the healthcare side, essentially they're just nursing homes and nursing home based. So there's a lot of issues in that. There's a lot more facilities requested there. Um, but if you look at other companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies specifically, um, they weren't as impacted because um, people are always in high demand or drugs are always in high demand to make people stay healthy. So it all depended on what we were doing in healthcare. I think that it was easier to analyze a more of a sub industry basis as opposed to just an industry basis. But um, yeah, definitely was interesting keeping up to the day to day with that. So that's essentially what I do and uh, how it was through the pandemic. I can only imagine how busy you were dealing with healthcare related things, uh, especially at the start. But thank you for sharing that with us. And moving on, Gabrielle, uh, could you tell us about your day to day? Yeah, sure. I'll echo what everyone's saying in terms of things being very busy. Um, like Anna, for myself, my mornings are usually packed with meetings. I'll say um, in terms of being in more of a strategy role, it's, it's an interesting team to be on in compensation because there is a yearly cycle, of course, of when we give out bonuses, increased salaries, all of those kinds of things um, towards the end of the year. Our fiscal year end is December 31st. So I'm definitely in the thick of it right now um, and just like getting ready for all that administrative side of things. But um, from a day-to-day -day perspective, strategy-wise, like we really are doing a lot of project management, working with our engineering teams, um, our communications teams and change management as we change our, you know, update comp strategy and what have you. Um, and that's definitely exciting. Um, my first role in ops was very transactional and I did enjoy that client experience and kind of being able to check off my boxes day to day, like making sure that everything that I could do was done and kind of just work as fast as I can to, um, you know, apply all those requests. Uh, and in this role, it does definitely shift and different times of the year are much busier than others. So although um, it is busy in general, we can prepare for that um, busy year end time. So every day does look a little bit different, but um, there is a bit more pr predictability in terms of what we can expect, at least on like a month to month basis. That's really wonderful that there's at least an idea for you as to, you know, which months are probably going to be the busier ones. And last but not least, Stephanie, would you mind sharing with us what a typical day looks like for you? Sure. Um, so I've been in, in my role for a little bit over two years now. Um, and, and the way that um, the analyst program works at BlackRock, or at least in, in my specific um, division, it's like year, year one and year two are supposed to be a little different. Um, year one, you're really like in the weeds, learning the product, um, learning all the tools that you're covering and like really trying to understand and get your bearings. Um, and you're, you know, it is a client facing role in the sense of like, you're talking to clients every day, you know, you're getting emails, you're going back and forth with clients and like helping them like resolve their issues. Um, so year one, I think for me was like very, you know, kind of like zoned in, in, you know, in front of my desk all day, just like on, on calls, on emails, you know, talking to my peers, really just trying to kind of, um, yeah, just like go, go by my day and, and, and kind of stay afloat. And then year two, you're kind of, um, you know, you're a senior analyst. Now you have a little bit more expertise and we are a little bit more niche and kind of like what we focus on. I focus on like operations. So year two, you're, you're definitely like more, um, you're specializing, you're kind of like a product expert and you're not, um, you know, on the phone as much with clients, you're still interacting with them via email and kind of um, 
helping sort out any issues, but you're also giving some projects with like other people, other stakeholders in the business to kind of like expand your, um, your knowledge base um, about like, you know, Aladdin and, and, and like the company and kind of, um, you know, moving after, after two and a half years in this role, you kind of move on to a different role. So your second year, you're really trying to learn about like what else is out there and, and kind of think about your, your next move. So that's kind of the, the space where I'm at now. Great. All right. Thank you for uh, sharing that with us, Stephanie. And so uh, we'll go ahead and move on to our next question, which is, you know, uh, all of our panelists, you all mentioned about how there were different niches. Uh, you guys have different interests. And even though you're all within the finance industry, you all also have some subfields that are your concentrations in a way. And so I'm wondering, you know, what made each of you interested in pursuing the finance industry and what kind of got you started and, you know, just what are your thoughts on what has changed, um, you know, over the past few years? And so, uh, Donald, would you be able to start us off? Um, yeah, sure. Putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, okay, but yeah, I think um, what got me into finance was um, basically in high school. I was I was in a, a, a macroeconomics class, and I, I just thought that was really interesting how quickly like things could change, like even in even in a macro sense, like. Um, how like each event in the world really has like some sort of impact to the economy in some way. Um, so I, I personally found like that class to be probably the most interesting class I ever taken in high school. Um, so um, yeah, I applied to Baruch and that, you know, Baruch is pretty well known for like finance and accounting and stuff like that in general. Um, so after, you know, after going to Baruch, I I tried out like some of the, you know, some niches in finance. Um, so I, you know, I, I interned as like a data analyst, um, also interned in like financial planning analysis, um, did like a venture capital intern. So like, you know, tried out, tried out many different things. And, um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, like when I was, you know, reaching graduation, I still wasn't too sure, like, you know, what, what exactly I, I wanted to do. So that that was kind of what landed me in the company that I am in now, like in a startup, because I feel like that gives me, you know, the, the variety and the view I, I wanted in order to kind of, um, you know, make sure that, you know, I, I'm in a job that I could stay interested in and, you know, be, be successful. Um, what was the second part of your question, actually? Just any thoughts you have on, you know, the way the industry may have changed over the past few years or anything that you like in particular about the industry, although I know you briefly touched upon just how you like the way, um, you know, the industry makes you feel like you can stay interested in a job. Yeah. Um, what changed in the, in the past few years? I mean, I, I think the pandemic definitely has a huge impact. And then if we're going a little further back, you know, the financial crisis was like another huge thing that happened. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I feel like, you know, things are, things are always changing. Like every, every single event leads to some sort of change. But um, yeah, I mean, with, with, with the pandemic, I feel like, you know, people started having like different focuses, um, like, you know, like some, some of the bigger companies that we know, like Amazon, like definitely, you know, even got even bigger. Um, but yeah, I think people also started I see like industry really just so like I, I guess from a you know from an industry standpoint there's definitely a lot moving. Yeah, I think we've all definitely gotten accustomed to especially within the past year. And kind of you know going on to our next panelist, my Michael, would you be able to tell us uh, your perspective on this? Yeah, so when I was actually going into Baruch, I still had a dream of becoming a lawyer, but it was really through coursework that I found that I have an appreciation for finance. And one of the big realizations that I made was if my career for the rest of my life is just going to be reading and writing based, um, I wouldn't be happy. Um, so I really looked for something that had a, a quantitative element to it. And that's kind of how I found bankruptcy and restructuring, because there still is a legal application. Um, the bankruptcy code and even out of court bankruptcies and credit documents, you do have some legal aspects, but 
the quantitative side that I was looking to satisfy is also definitely satisfied. Um, and yeah, that's what led me to the path I'm on. And as far as how my role has changed during the pandemic, um, I'd say there's a pretty drastic change. Uh, being a consultant, one of the things that appealed to me was popping between clients. So different clients were in different locations. So prior to the pandemic, I was definitely traveling a lot. Um, the last client that I was working on um, was a telecommunications company that was headquartered in Norwalk, Connecticut. Um, so they were just imagine like a Verizon files providing internet TV and phone services to individual residential households, small and large companies. And the day to day looked more, more often than not, we traveled. And when we did travel, we'd usually leave Sunday night, um, head up to Norwalk and sleep Sunday to Monday. So then Monday we were up ready to work with, uh, with our counterparts at the company. And then either Wednesday or Thursday, we would head back down to New York City where we'd finish up the day in the office. And then Friday was usually the day where um, the group got lunch together. Uh, so as you might imagine, traveling was significantly reduced. Um, so I still remember it was a Wednesday or a Thursday where we came back and um, we were in New York. And that's when we got notifications that college sports was shutting down. Broadway was shutting down. And I didn't know it, that, but that was going to be the last time I was in the office for about 15 or 16 months. Um, so over that time, it was pretty much exclusively working from home, no client travel. Um, and more recently, I've started going back to the office maybe once or twice a week. Um, but that was a very drastic shift in what the lifestyle for a consultant is like. And as far as the future looks, um, there's still some debate about how much travel will come back, whether or not we'll be traveling on a regular basis like we did historically. Um, but that's still up to uh, up in the air. Yeah, I think a lot of us never expected our last days, you know, either in person at campus or in person at an office to be that last day. We all thought it was going to be like a two week, you know, hiatus yeah. and then two weeks kind of spun into like one year and more and kind of going on with that uh gabrielle would you be able to go next to tell us more about uh yeah sure so i think part of your question was about like niches and passions like outside of work i guess or like combining things um another thing that i did in college i majored in economics but i minored in music i got an arts administration certificate i was part of the macaulay trip the acapella group I don't know if they're still performing a background in the performing arts I but I was always very good at math my grandfather was an engineer I always felt like math was my best subject and my favorite subject so when I went into school I ended up going to Hunter so I could kind of you know do do the art thing but also um I ended up majoring in economics to kind of get a real world application of all of those different mathematical practices right um and I did intern at a couple of different like nonprofit arts programs. I was trying to really, that's your time during college to kind of test the water, see what makes sense for you, right? Um, and after those internships, I was still very much interested in the arts sector, um, but I felt like I wanted to start my career in a place that was challenging, that had a lot of resources for me, that was fast paced in a way that I could one, get paid, two, feel like I'm learning really quickly in the matter of a year, two years, et cetera. I'm, I'm now at the firm a little over two years. Um, and I do feel like, you know, now that I'm at this point, it's really helpful to, you know, I still take voice lessons. I just saw a Broadway show for the first time this week after work. Like there's a lot of really, you know, I just love living in New York because there are so many ways for you to kind of combine all of those different interests. And I do, you know, have to think very creatively at work and it kind of keeps me sane because it's this left brain, right brain kind of stuff happening, right? Um, throughout my day and my week. Um, so that's just like things that kind of help me and like motivate me like throughout my career. Um, in terms of, you know, I guess I'll rephrase the question in terms of COVID, right? Because a lot of people are talking about how life has changed since the pandemic. I definitely feel for you guys as college students, right? Because it's just such a different experience. And um, 
it is a different experience for me too, right? I started in 2019, more than half of my time at the firm has been in this COVID remote slash hybrid situation. But um, the first couple of years really help you understand um, what it means to find out the culture of your workplace, find out how your team operates, all of those kinds of things. A lot of that feels intangible, at least it did for me when I was looking for jobs and like starting right out of school. Um, and the more you work with your team, some teams are more, again, team-based, team meetings, let's make sure we're all posted on everything going on and other teams are, you know, here's your book of work, get it done. Let me know if any issues and you have to figure out what works better for you. Um, some, some teams are more transactional, short-term assignment. Some teams are more long-term strategy. And when it comes to culture, coming back to the COVID piece, it definitely feels, at least to me, that it is, I can only speak for my own company, it is a company culture thought process that has come into this return to office kind of lifestyle. So, you know, we're all young and there are like different um, priorities in terms of career and life outside of work, all those kinds of things. But that's definitely something as you're looking into where you want to start your career, um, what's important for you in terms of flexibility, in terms of remote work versus not. Um, Goldman is a firm that has kind of pioneered in the banking space in terms of returning to office. I didn't return to office until I was vaccinated, but people were in the office as of September, like a year ago today, basically, um, as of September 2020. And that's good news for some people. That's not good news for some people. So it just helps you get a sense of, you know, the more you're in the workforce, the more you'll understand what works for you and what's good news. Um, and it definitely is a, a cultural aspect of how is the firm led? How does your team run? What's your relationship with your manager? All of those things. So hopefully that's helpful in terms of um, the change and COVID kind of helps you assess, you know, where, where you're sitting in terms of company culture. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And sure. I love how, you know, you were able to combine both the economics and also the um, performing arts aspect of your major and your minor. And it's, you know, it goes to show you don't need to be narrowed down to just one specific path. There are a lot of ways you can intertwine two different, completely different majors. And going uh, on with that, uh, John, would you be able to share with us next? Yeah, of course. Um, I actually thought I would do consulting out of college. I did have a couple of finance internships, uh, one at a healthcare company, one at a media company, and it just so happened by chance, I get to actually cover both of them at work still. Um, but I actually found my job through the Macaulay Career Portal. So I definitely recommend everyone here utilize your campus resources. They are amazing. They really can help you. Um, and I think why I like what I do is I think it's kind of the perfect marriage between the two things I enjoy most. When I was in college, which is a sort of business analysis and problem solving, and also writing, um, I used to be the, the VP of content for the Macaulay Business Club, and I'd edit all the articles there too. So it kind of merged the two things that I liked the most, and I got to continually do it, um, and I'm still doing it now. Um, as a perspective on the finance industry, I am relatively new out of college, so it's harder for me, I guess, to get like a more long-term landscape, I will say it seems like there is a very big shift in interest in ESG considerations, uh, particularly with the uh, effects of climate change, uh, certain energy companies going into business overnight that were A-rated companies. So it's definitely prompted a lot of thinking about where investments are going and uh, what kind of relationships specifically banks want to build uh, in the future to make sure they're sustainable. Thank you for sharing that with us, John. And um, you know, it's really wonderful how Macaulay has been able to help you and just a shameless plug here, but if anybody hasn't already signed up for our new job portal, because we actually recently transitioned, make sure you check out how to sign up for your Handshake account. But uh, we'll move on from the career portals, but Stephanie, would you be able to share with us next? Yeah, sure. Um, so I remember when I was in college, I was like definitely very lost. I didn't know what I wanted to study. I didn't know if I wanted to do finance or if I wanted to do law, or if I wanted to do like arts, like I had no idea. Um, and so I think for me, what helped me was like talking to people in the industries um, and kind of like echoing what John said earlier, like using the resources at Queens College, like really helped me. Um, I got involved with, um, I, I joined the American Needs Youth Fellowship Program, which was like a two year career development program for first generation college students. And that like really 
kind of just like, you know, elevated me on a different level. It connected me with like professionals in different industries um, where I was able to like ask questions here, like kind of like what we're doing here, hear about like what their day to day was, what, you know, kind of just gather all of my information to like make some sort of, you know, general direction on what to study and what to major in. Um, when I kind of like, and just like speaking to people, I felt like, okay, like, you know, business finance seems, seems kind of interesting. Um, and then I, you know, I would do like the office tours, like go into like Goldman and go into JP, you know, and they would do like a career fair and you kind of like talk to people who work there and like step into the office. And, you know, I think all those things kind of helped me as someone who was like completely lost decide like, okay, I could see myself doing this. I, you know, took some econ classes. I really liked them. Um, and I was like a little bit of trial and error, like, okay, I think this, this kind of looks good for me and sounds good. And I'm, I'm going to try it out. And, you know, I did some internships to kind of get my feet wet. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of how I started. And, and I think like I'm two years in and I'll say like, it's, it definitely been, been challenging in the beginning for sure. But um, I really like where I'm at. And I think it's, it's a really, you know, it's a really good place to be. I think it makes like being in, in this industry, I think it makes you like a very like worldly person and you're kind of like you're aware of like you know in the know all the time and kind of aware of what's what's going on around you so it, it is it is exciting and and yeah it's worked out I liked it that's wonderful and kind of going back to you know the similar experiences you had with John how a lot of these career services and these you know tools that are made available really do help you know students decide what they want to do later on. And so moving on, uh, I'd like to ask Anna if you could share with us and, you know, I'm sure your Macaulay experience may be a little bit different from the rest of our panelists. Is there anything about, you know, your Macaulay experience too that you felt really helped you get your feet into this industry? Ah, uh, that was, that, that I, I would say that was more a self-driven thing because back then it, I was the first year when Macaulay College started. So everything was like trial and error. So the program was so new. Um, and obviously the teamwork element where you get to work with, you know, um, students from out of campus. Oh, I was like a finance major in a borough campus, but, you know, obviously you get to um, work with other, you know, people from Hunters and, and Queens College and, you know, kind of like uh, in a quick way to develop your um, vulnerability and build relationship, you know, across um, out of campuses and with students that you probably don't even like know. Um, so, you know, obviously that brings an aspect of um, how the program helped me. Um, I will echo that, you know, similar uh, idea that actually progressed into my grad school. So I got my executive MBA at Kellogg Northwestern. Um, I did the global executive MBA where I studied in Hong Kong, KUST, as well as Germany and um, Israel campus, our uh, Tel Aviv campus. So, uh, you know, it, it kind of reminds me similar of what Macaulay was doing where they will have students that are coming in from globally and then, you know, a whole different culture that you get to, you know, leverage what they know and what they are experts in and, you know, kind of build that relationships and, and you know, transfer, translate and transfer that skill set into your um, day to day, yeah. That's wonderful. And I, I think that's one of the best parts uh, as a Macaulay student, if I may say so, just getting to meet people from all different parts of the world with their own cultures. And it really does uh, have an impact on you know, the things you decide you may be interested in. And uh, of course, last but not least, uh, Max, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about how you know, your interest got started? Yeah, sure. Um, and I, I know a lot of people have gone to, I'll try not to, to take too much time. Um, I, I've always been interested in business. My, my dad started a company with his brother, my uncle, uh, many years ago, uh, so he's basically selling healthy snacks. So I was always interested in selling things to people and making money. And, and you know, that kind of broadened out as I got older to how financial markets, you know, basically have their legs in, in every piece of the world. Um, I, I was very interested in venture capital, uh, starting college. Uh, I had an internship at a VC firm. It was super interesting interesting and I wanted something very different, which to me was banking because you're working on, you know, very established large scale transactions for, you know, well-known household name companies. Um, I really liked it. Uh, super interesting. It's very dynamic. Um, 
I, I guess in terms of how the how the role has shifted, and I don't I don't want to sound like a broken record, but um, you know, of course, COVID has um, I think changed the world in, in some ways forever, uh, but in other ways, it's it's kind of too early to tell because we're still experiencing change. I think the biggest shift, maybe it's away from work a little bit, is just a, a, a reshift in in prioritization for everyone, right? People look at everything differently. You know, what's important to them? Where do they want to be spending their time? Is travel worth it? Is it not worth it? What do I want to spend money on? Where do I want to live? Do I want to work from home? Do I like being alone? It's been very interesting to see that basically ripple into personal and professional decisions. So, um, you know, a little open-ended, but, um, you know, still applicable. Yeah, I think that's really great insight. And even with COVID, you know, we started to think that maybe we were getting to the end of it and then Delta kind of popped up and changed the trajectory for many different fields and many individuals. And so right now we are at around the 648 mark. So we're going to be starting breakout rooms at around seven. But before we jump into that, I'd like to ask each of our panelists an individual question based on their own experiences. And starting with Donald, not to put you on the spot again, but I know your bio indicates that you've worked at Basecap Analytics, which is a finance tech startup uh, since you've graduated in 2017. So I'm interested to know, you know, was there a reason specifically that you chose to work with a startup as compared to a major corporation uh, upon graduation? Yeah, so I think I, I touched upon this a little bit previously, but um, part of it is just like, I, I actually wanted the variety that came with working at a startup. Um, I felt like, you know, a lot of the companies at internet were really big companies like Fortune 500s and stuff like that. And I felt like I was always put into a very niche role, um, which is expected, right? Um, but basically, I, I felt that, you know, I didn't have like the best room for growth or that, you, you know, I wanted to kind of see what else is going on in, in the company. It was not really that, that flexible to do so. Um, so, you know, I actually applied on um, Baruch's career website for this company. Um, the CFO and founder was actually a Baruch alumni that graduated, like, I think around 10 years before me. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's why he posted there and, yeah, and it just it just worked out really well. Um, at first, when I got there, you know, I was a little bit scared, um, just because you know I was I I felt like I was the only person that was like coming straight from college. Everyone else there kind of had some experience. They were young, but still had you know a lot of experience over me. Um, and the other thing was working at a startup when when a company is that small, you don't have like a training program that like many of my friends um, had. Like they had this like six month training thing at, at a lot of banks or like. Um, you know, some of them have like a, like a three month trial period or whatever, or like a rotational program, like there's all these different things. For me, it was just kind of like, okay, let's put you on a client and, you know, get, give you some work to do. Um, so yeah, it was definitely not easy. Like at, at the beginning, I was, I was struggling a lot, um, you know, maybe even dealt with like some imposter syndrome here and there, which is where like, you kind of feel like you're, you're there, but you, you also feel like you, you, you don't really belong um, at, at the same time. Um, and, you know, it took some, you know, personal development and personal growth to kind of get over that and, um, you know, had to do some studying on the side sometimes like on the weekends just to like catch up because there was no like formal training. Um, but I, I think like once I got over the hump, like around a year in, you, I, I got really comfortable and I realized that, you know, being one of the earlier people at the company that's growing so much, you, you get you get a lot of you know, kind of advantages that um, often others don't get, um, kind of, you know, get, get, get first pick on some things and just, you know, you have a bigger voice than others would in, in a similar situation at, at, um, at a bigger company. So yeah, I, I really liked it. And I, I, I encourage people to um, seek out startups as an option. Um, you don't have to do it. Some people don't like it, it might not be for you, but I, I think just having in your mind as an option is a great idea. Yeah, thank you for telling us about that. I do think it's wonderful how you know, everyone who's attending this event has a better idea of the differences between a startup versus a corporation. And of course, everyone will make that decision based on you know, their personality, how they know themselves to be. And so moving on, uh, Anna, so I know you've worked with various companies and you have a very impressive and extensive background, including with you know, Stem Cell, Tokyo, uh, Stem Cell Co. in Tokyo, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, 
Has there been any overlap between your roles at these different companies? And are there major differences from, you know, the finance industry in you know, Tokyo or, you know, compared to New York or even just the APEC region? Yeah, I would say um, the so when I was working for for Wells Fargo and at the same time I was consulting for the uh, the biotech company in APEC. And the area that we're covering are very different. So the Wells Fargo, I was in the secondary markets and versus it the, with the biotech company, I was in the um, pre-IPO stage. So my job for them is to raise capital um, to help the company originally, which was listed in um, US OTC board to be delisted. Um, because they were under a very poor management team by the CFO. And I was working, reporting to the new CFO to re-ramp up the entire business and their balance sheet so then they can get relisted in the Hong Kong um, board exchange. Um, so it, it was a very fun project. And so the area are not exactly overlapping, um, but I would say like it gives it gave me like exposure for both the the primary world versus the secondary market world. And I, I found that, you know, both have their own strengths and both have their own fun um, area. Like in the, in the primary market, like pre-IPO stage, you're encountering and you're dealing with a lot of companies that, that not necessarily want to go to IPO. And sometimes even if they do want to go IPO, they might not necessarily be at the right stage to go on IPO. So then your job, um, not only is trying to help them to raise money or get to that stage, you're also involving in strategic strategies. Um, you're working with the CEO, CEO, CFO, and operation to bring up business development to help get there. For example, if they're not ready to go IPO in the next three months, what can we do 12 months down the road? So you have to now think about go to um, your strategic partnership. Is there anyone else that you can work with in terms of, you know, building up your pipeline, building up your revenue and make yourselves to reach that point where you're ready. Um, so then, you know, a lot of strategy involved on that sector. Um, and what's your second question again? Uh, my second question was just if there was any major differences between like Tokyo and uh, the U.S. Yeah, so like the, I would say the risk appetites are different, um, you know, in, in, regulations are very different and obviously you know um apec versus like us are uh, very different our investor for example when we were raising money in china you also have to deal with um helping the company in in china investor in china to get a, a subsidiary companies in hong kong because um rmb is not directly translating into us dollars so you got to go into the hong kong dollar which is can be, you know, um, using effects into US dollar. Otherwise, you know, at the same time, when you're doing these transactions, you're also thinking about like um, FX exposure. So um, from a investor perspective, they also have to think about oh, how do I hedging off my FX exposure when I'm doing, um, you know, cross-border transactions. So when you're in, in Tokyo itself, if they're just investing locally, there's no such a you know worry, but once you start getting involvement with other regional investors, then you have to you know um, consider a lot of these like compliance and regulatory requirements. All right, uh, thank you so much for telling us about that, and it's so great to have you know a global perspective and go beyond just uh, what we may see here on Wall Street or within New York City. And so uh, moving on, Max, uh, I would like to ask you, so prior to working as an associate at Barclays, I noticed you actually took part in a Barclays Investment uh, Summer Analyst Program during your sophomore year of college. Did your participation in these programs kind of help you confirm that this was the field for you? And you know, if so, did that kind of influence your decision to continue working at Barclays after graduation? Yeah, definitely. Um... It, it absolutely did. And for people who aren't uh, familiar, so I, I work in, in Bar at Barclays, which is a, a large bank, part of which is an investment bank. And broadly speaking, the investment bank is made up of two arms, capital markets and coverage banking. And, you know, the, the focus areas and, and, the, and the responsibilities and the jobs are completely different, but so is the culture. And so part of what I learned about myself and what I'm after during that internship was the environment in which I thrive in terms of, you know, work and, and, and people and interaction. And so I guess 
you know, for, for people thinking about their roles um, and what careers they want to pursue, you know, one question I think is, is helpful to think through is, do you like working in a team environment where there's a lot of energy and people are talking and you're sitting directly next to someone? Would you rather be in more of a library-like environment where you have your cubicle, it's quiet, you put on headphones, you do your own work? Do you like sitting next to people who are significantly older and more senior to you? Or would you rather kind of be housed with the people who are at your level? You know, it was those kinds of questions that um, solidified my interest, not only at Barclays, but specifically within capital markets. So um, definitely the internship, I think as much as it teaches you what you, what you do like, it teaches you what, you know, you may not love so much either. That's wonderful. And uh, I think that's also definitely why a lot of the times, you know, we hear our advisors or uh, counselors will, you know, uh, emphasize, you know, you should always take up an internship, you never know what you might learn or what you might find that really connects with you. And so uh, next for Stephanie, um, so you also similar to Max, uh, you did participate in a program at BlackRock before you started working there full time. So I'm wondering, you know, what was your experience like as an intern and how did that program impact your decision in any way to work for BlackRock after graduation? Yeah, so I did um, my internship my junior year of college at BlackRock in the same um, team that I'm currently working at. Um, and I definitely like the, that that experience was, um, you know, the reason for why I came back. I think it was, uh, I had another internship the summer before that, that was um, completely different. It was very like um, less structured. Um, there wasn't a lot of like uh, clear um, tasks. And I felt like I had a lot of like free time on my plate. Um, when I came to the internship at BlackRock, I really felt like you know, it was very structured. There was, you know, my days were back to back. I had a lot of meetings. I had a lot of um, exposure to senior, um, senior people at the firm, um, you know, and people were really excited to, to talk to you. And, and you know, and you, you, you know, you had the freedom to talk to either the analyst next to you or like the senior person managing, managing the team. Um, and, and, you know, and I think, Beyond all of that, I think I, I really, really liked the, the people that I was around. I, I was surrounded by like really smart, you know, young, motivated, um, really like, you know, awesome people. And, and that energy like really, I think is contagious. And I, and I really, you know, kind of went off of, off of that, that energy. Um, and I'll say like, it was a very challenging internship, um, you know, I think just like the amount of information that, that, that was thrown at us at that time, everything was completely new. I've never heard of Aladdin. I didn't know what, you know, a platform like this looked like. I didn't know what all of the th things that they were teaching us. I've never seen any of it before. So it was definitely very new and, and there was a, a really like steep learning curve. Um, but I felt like for me, I had learned more in those two months than I had in like an entire semester at college. And so I think for me, that's really what stuck to me is that like, I felt like I had grown so much. I'd learned so much, like I developed so many skills in like such a short amount of time. And, and, and I think that was one of the main, main reasons for why I really enjoyed it and wanted to come back. That's really wonderful. And I definitely agree that, you know, internships teach us a lot more than what you might necessarily learn from being in five different classes in a semester. It's just a lot of hands-on experience. And so uh, we are running a little bit short on time. So we do want to move into our breakout rooms um, to allow all of the students to be able to actually ask questions because I'm sure they all have a lot of wonderful questions. And so I'm sorry to the panelists that we didn't get to for the individual questions, but Hopefully we'll get around to them uh, when we meet in the individual breakout rooms. And so Gia is going to be uh, putting everyone into breakout rooms. And so what we'll do is every 10 minutes, we're going to rotate. And so everyone will have a chance to speak with all of our panelists. And you'll see a little reminder at the top when it's around the one or two minute mark. So just be prepared for when the room shifts. Uh, I know sometimes conversations get cut out, but we're hoping at the end we'll be able to share the LinkedIn information for all of our panelists so that any students who are interested in connecting can reach out to you personally afterwards. And so I'll and hand that over to Gia. Yes. In terms of rotating, are the panelists yes. rotating or are the students rotating? Because if both, uh, then we'll, we're going to get Yeah, on. so uh, we're going to be rotating the panelists, but Gia okay. is going to be moving everyone. So uh, no, no one else has to move anything. Yeah. So it's going to be all set. Yep. All right. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.